clear. It's certainly a pleasure uh, uh, to give this talk today and thank you for your kind invitation. I thought we can talk about some, something that is more relevant to our situation these days. Um, a phone call from a DZ patient, how we can make the diagnosis remotely. Um, uh, perhaps the casual... Uh, uh, Amir, can title. you turn up your volume slightly or maybe speak a little louder? I'm sorry. Okay, is that better now? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, perhaps a casual um, title for this talk could be, Hello, can you hear me, Doc? I am very dizzy. Well, I don't know about India, but uh, under normal business, when you try to reach your doctor here in the U.S., this is when you what you get usually. If this is an emergency, please hang up and call 911. I guess that would be 112 in India. Uh, but uh, let's see if we can actually turn it around and see if we can help our patients remotely over the phone or using a video call. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, Naturally, evaluating a dizzy patient in the office is challenging, let alone if you want to do it remotely or virtually. So if see, see if we can today, by going over the key components of the history and talking about virtual examinations, looking for signs of vestibular dysfunction, either peripheral or central, or considering the main differential diagnosis in acute uh, dizzy patient, we can um, tackle this uh, problem. So here's the phone call. Um, the patient calls you and uh, uh, says, I woke up this morning and when I got out of the bed, I became dizzy with spinning and feeling off balance and queasy. I staggered to the bathroom and vomited. I'm now lying in bed and feel a little bit better, but I'm afraid to get up. What do I do? So what's the best answer to this patient? Should we say, okay, stay in bed, send your spouse or, or whoever is with you to the pharmacy for meclizine, take a few pills and call me tomorrow if you're not better? Should we tell them that, oh, if you don't feel better by late morning, come to my office this afternoon? Or just should we ask them to go immediately to the hospital? So what are the key components within the history that can help our approach to a diagnosis? Well, the key components are symptoms, timing, trigger, and risk factor. So uh, we're trying to uh, review those in the following slides. Uh, should one focus on the quality of symptoms? Dizziness is a loosely used term that means different things to different people. It may describe sensation related to vestibular dysfunction, which often includes a component of false movement perception or spatial disorientation, but it could also describe feeling of faint, confused, unsteadiness, disconnected, anxious, or other sensory discomfort from non-vestibular causes, for example, from cardiac, metabolic, or psychiatric problems. Also, uh, changes in visual and proprioceptive inputs or poor central integration of sensory signals can all lead to symptoms described as dizziness. So is it a helpful strategy to try to clarify the symptoms with the patients. So what do patients mean exactly by their symptoms? Is it possible to match them with defined terminologies that can help us narrow down on a, diagno on a diagnosis? So according to the classification, international classification of vestibular symptoms, vertigo is a sensation of self-motion, but no self-motion is occurring or when there is a distorted self-motion during a normal head movement. Vertigo could be internal, which means that there is a sensation of self-motion, or it could be external when there is a visual sense of motion of the environment. In this sense, um, uh, uh, oscillopsia is similar to external vertigo, except that there is a back and forth movement. There is a component of bouncing. So a helpful feature when when a patient describes oscillopsia to inquire whether it is head movement induced or is it spontaneous. There are also other visual symptoms that patients may describe, including visual lag, visual tilt, or visual blur. Visual lag is a false sensation that the visual world is falling behind the head movement with a delay or makes a brief drift after the head movement is completed. Visual tilt is the false perception of the visual surround as being oriented off the true vertical. Visual blur is the reduced visual acuity or uh, momentary uh, lapse after the head movement. 
While vertigo is a distorted sense of motion, dizziness is a disturbed or impaired sense of spatial orientation without the motion component. Um, patients may also report postural or balance symptoms. Uh, uh, for example, unsteadiness is a feeling of being unstable while seated, standing, or walking without a particular directional preference, while directional pulsion is a tendency to veer or fall in a specific direction. Falls, balance related near falls are imminent falls with the ability to catch oneself, and balance related falls are imminent fall without the ability to catch oneself. So, so putting symptoms in these categories, which are mainly vertigo as internal or external sensation, dizziness, or dizziness and posture and balance symptoms can really help understand what patients describe better. But are such subjective qualities of symptoms reliable? to take into account for making the diagnosis. This is a study from 2017 that looked into uh, how patients described their symptoms. They had about 320 patients and they used different means of asking uh, patients about their symptoms uh, with open-ended questions, closed-ended questions. And as you can see here, um, majority of patients when asked in different ways, they picked more than one category to describe their symptoms. What, with about one third of the patients uh, actually describing more than three categories when uh, they tried to describe their symptoms. Uh, this findings emphasizes that what patients mean by dizziness is often less reliable for diagnosis. And in fact, timing and triggers could be more reliable features during the history to to understand the better or approach towards a diagnosis. What are the important aspects of the temporal profile and triggers that um, uh, should be considered? When asking about timing of the symptoms, it's helpful to know whether this is a single episode or recurrent episodes. How long does one completed spell last? Is it brief? Is it prolonged? Minutes? Hours? Days? Um, or whether symptoms are transient, intermittent, or persistent. When uh, probing uh, the patient about the triggers, it's helpful to find if uh, they can be put into a specific category. Are they uh, spontaneous or they, they're triggered? And if they're triggered, uh, are there specific uh, uh, triggers for these symptoms? Are they positional, for example, head motion induced, visual induced? sound induced, valsalva induced, orthostatic. You can uh, ask patients uh, directly, what can you do to bring on the spell or um, go over some common scenarios can, that can bring on their symptoms, including standing quickly, coughing, straining, rolling over in bed, shaking or moving the head, looking at phone or screens, or being in specific positions like bending over, reaching for a high shelf, lying back in bed, or etc. So by combining the timing and triggers, we can approach the diagnosis. For example, a recurrent transient positional induced symptoms can suggest BPPD or single prolonged spontaneous persistent symptoms could suggest something like vestibular neuritis or stroke. When approaching the patient other, uh, other than temporal profile triggers and quality of uh, uh, dizziness or vertigo, there are also other important features that can help. For example, the age of the patient, vascular risk factors, whether there are uh, other neurological symptoms involved, whether there is a head, headache or neck pain or, <clears throat> excuse me, or whether there are hearing symptoms along with the dizziness. <clears throat> the main differential diagnosis to uh, consider when uh, dealing with an acute patient uh, are a diagnosis of stroke, BPPV, vestibular neuritis, vestibular migraine, and Meniere's disease. So we're going to go over all of these diagnoses and then uh, we talk about the virtual examination that mainly focuses on signs of vestibular ocular imbalance and gait and stance. So uh, 
In vestibular neuritis, uh, there is a sustained vertigo when at rest, but it can get worse with movement. Uh, nausea and vomiting are common features of the presentation. Uh, there is no hearing change along with the vertigo, and it's common to, uh, to see a preceding viral illness uh, before the onset of the dizziness and vertigo. Uh, patients with a stroke may report dizziness or vertigo. Uh, there could be headache or neck pain along with the dizziness. There are often other neurological symptoms involved, such as diplopia, numbness, weakness, hiccup, dysartia, or ataxia. When there is an acute hearing loss, uh, this is an uh, alarming sign and uh, should be considered as a sign of a stroke. Um, and there are also risk factors that one should always consider when uh, talking to the patient uh, to consider a diagnosis of a stroke, for example, age, hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease, and diabetes. Vestibular migraine uh, could also um, uh, present with dizziness or vertigo. There is a headache component, family history of migraine. The episodes could be recurrent. Um, headache history might be remote and there could be dissociation between vestibular symptoms and headache and they do not happen at the same time. Uh, there's often aura symptoms involved such as light and sound sensitivity and there could be some uh, hearing symptoms along with the dizziness such as pain, pressure, or fullness in the ears and symptoms are typically relieved by sleep. Uh, patients with uh, vertigo, uh, they often present, uh, patients with Meniere's disease, they often present with vertigo. Uh, they have oral symptoms, uh, including pain, pressure, seashell tinnitus, or fullness in the ears. There's a, a typical fluctuating hearing loss, which is often frequency along uh, with the symptoms. Uh, some uh, an interesting uh, component of uh, the presentation could be the Lair Moyes phenomenon, which is hearing uh, improvement in hearing as the vertigo uh, begins, uh, and uh, drop attacks could be also a part of the presentation. BPPV symptoms are positional. Uh, they, uh, usually patients develop them by turning over in bed or get, get in, out of, in or out of the bed. They're transient, could be recurrent, and there could be some inciting events such as being uh, to a dentist, hairdresser, trauma, or prolonged bed rest. So overall, looking at these diagnoses um, and considering the temporal profile and triggers, um, Stroke and TIA symptoms can last from minutes to hours. Migraine patients can also have symptoms from minutes to days. Many years symptoms last for hours. BPPV symptoms are brief and they usually last uh, for seconds. Vestibular neuritis symptoms uh, are however longer and can last for days. All of these diagnoses can be recurrent except for patients with vestibular neuritis that often don't present again with the same symptoms. Um, so that, that could be something to consider uh, when talking to the patients. In terms of the uh, triggers, uh, when symptoms are spontaneous and they don't uh, usually, they're not usually triggered by, um, by any uh, uh, position, for example, or, or other uh, common triggers are stroke and vestibular neuritis. Um, the symptoms could be positional in BPPV and migraine. They could be visually induced in migraine and stroke or sound induced in migraine. When there is this orthostatic component, one can think about TIA or stroke. When it comes to other neurological symptoms, uh, patients with TIA or stroke or migraine often report other neurological symptoms along with dizziness. Headache or neck pain could be common features in stroke and migraine. And history of head trauma or unusual head postures uh, suggest BPPV and stroke, and hearing symptoms could be seen in many years, migraine uh, or stroke. Vascular risk factors obviously suggest a stroke, and um, certain age range um, uh, suggests uh, uh, likelihood of certain diagnoses. For example, um, a, uh, like older folks may present uh, more often with stroke or BPPV or younger folks with migraine. So these are important factors and components of the history to consider when, when you're talking to the patients. And obviously uh, other important components that we should not forget when 
talking to the patients or cardiac symptoms and causes, recent medication uses, anxiety, panic, and hyperventilation syndromes that can often present with symptoms similar to uh, vertigo and dizziness. So these are the, uh, uh, the important components of the history. We're going to get back to it, but I wanted to uh, also touch on the virtual exam and some of the key signs uh, that uh, one can look for. And those are the signs of vestibular imbalance, which uh, is mainly nystagmus when it comes to semicircular canals and autolith tilt reaction when it comes to the autolith function. And here are a um, couple of videos that uh, actually patients uh, recorded their nystagmus. So this is doable. And uh, if patients are instructed, they can actually get th their cell phones close enough uh, to capture their, um, their uh, eye movements. So here's the patients trying to uh, get the video recording of their uh, nystagmus. And this is a patient with BPPV is recording um, their nystagmus as they're lying in bed. So, so this is actually doable. So it's possible to do a um, um, virtual examination uh, using uh, portable devices. Okay, so before we get into the nystagmus, let's start with the synopsis on VOR physiology. When the head moves, uh, the eyes rotate in the opposite direction within the same plane. For example, when the head rotation is to the right, the right horizontal canal is excited and the left horizontal canal is inhibited. And likewise, there are parallel eye and head movements in the opposite direction with VOR during head movements that involve vertical canals or combination of all the canals. So here's the guide to understand the nystagmus with the stimulation of each canal. For example, um, when there is a stimulation of the anterior canal, there is an upward movement of the eye and a torsional movement of the eye in the opposite, uh, towards the opposite ear. Um, when there is a combination of um, canal stimulation, there is a summation of these slow phase uh, movement. Like for example, when there's a right anterior canal and left anterior a canal stimulation, the torsional components cancel each other out and there is a pure um, movement of the eyes upwards. So there is a, uh, when, uh, when there is a right anterior canal and right posterior canal uh, stimulation, the, the, the vertical component of the eye movement cancel each other out and there you get a torsional movement. Or when there is a combination of these three canal movement, you get the combination of a torsional horizontal movement. Since the chances that you get both ears involved is less with peripheral uh, disorders, usually when there is a pure vertical or torsional uh, nystagmus, uh, it is uh, seen with central disorders. Whereas when there is a combination of all three canal involvement on one side, it is more uh, common in peripheral disorders. So let's take a uh, close look. Uh, just one more point to mention about nystagmus. This, this guide is, is showing the slow phase movement during the stimulation. So when there's a loss of function, there will be opposite of that movement. And we can take a closer look here. Uh, so when there was a uh, anterior canal stimulation, there was an uh, uh, upward movement of the eye. So with loss of function, this slow phase movement will be downward. And as a result, there's gonna be an upbeating nystagmus. So with, right, with the anterior canal hypofunction, there's an upbeat torsional nystagmus. Um, excuse me. There, there's, there's gonna be an upbeating torsional nystagmus. Uh, with the top pole of the eyes beating away from the side of the lesion. So we're going to get a closer view of the nystagmus soon. So upbeating torsional nystagmus 
with the top pole beating away from the side of the lesion. So this is the left anterior semicircular canal hypofunction. So this is similar to the nystagmus that you see with the right posterior canal excitation or BPPV. How about the uh, left posterior canal um, hypofunction? The nystagmus is gonna be opposite. So nystagmus is gonna be down beating and torsional. Again, with the top pole beating away from the side of the lesion. And we're going to have the uh, closer view soon. And here it is. So up beating torsional with the top pole beating away from side of the lesion. Uh, here's the um, both uh, posterior and anterior nystagmus together. And you can see one, the torsional component is the same, but one of it is up beating and one of them is down beating. And here's the horizontal canal hypofunction. So this one only presents with the horizontal uh, nystagmus with the slow phase towards the weaker side and the fast phase towards the healthy side. And there's no torsional component. So if you combine all these three canals, and you look at the patient's nystagmus, you can put it into the canal and also the side and determine where the nystagmus is coming from. For example, um, let's go over this one. Uh, so what canal hypofunctions do we see here? So this is a patient with right beating torsional nystagmus. There is a horizontal and torsional component. Uh, it is up beating torsional component with a fast phase going towards the right side. So this is going to be um, a left lateral and left anterior semicircular canal hypofunction. This is something common with superior division vestibular neuritis. So by, by using that kind uh, guide that I showed you earlier, you can put the nystagmus into a context and determine the side and uh, canal involvement. So uh, it, this, uh, this app can uh, make our lives easier because you can also actually simulate these um, canal involvements and uh, look at that and uh, uh, determine the canal involvement or the side of involvement. So if you wanna download it and use it, it's a very helpful resource. Uh, so let's see if we can um, uh, localize the nystagmus. So here, do we have the uh, audience response system or shall I just go ahead and... Uh, or I'll just go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, I mean, I could not set up the questions. Oh, so okay, then. Uh, we can okay, just then. ask. I maybe, won't be maybe, able to get the uh, maybe, audience maybe response. Can use the, maybe we can use the chat room. I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. But... Uh, <laughs> Can we use the can chat room or should I just go? Uh, I think we can just go what... Uh, okay, that's fine, that's fine. We have let people yeah. guess for themselves. We don't have to get the answer. Okay. Uh, but you, I mean, like you've given the answer, let people uh, see for themselves what they think is... Uh, Sounds good, okay. So, so where's the localization of the stack was in this case? Um, so I'm gonna play that. So... This is a right beating nystagmus. Uh, it gets worse looking to the right. And let's see what happens when, you, when the patient looks to the left. It is less pronounced looking to the left. So, so it's a right beating nystagmus, which shows that the, the weaker side is probably the left side. So, so one of these two answers are correct. This tag was from either left peripheral vestibular loss or a left pontine lesion. So the main question here is, is it a central or a peripheral uh, uh, nystagmus? Given that uh, this nystagmus is worse with looking towards the fast phase or to the right side, it is more likely that it's a peripheral 
uh, Ms. Daggers, and this is called Alexander's Law. Uh, central lesions could also show Alexander's Law, but, um, but it is more uh, common to see it uh, with peripheral lesions. Okay, so, so here are the important uh, features of the nystagmus that can help peripheral and central lesions. When there is a mixed horizontal torsion nystagmus, it is a characteristic of uh, complete loss of function on one side uh, and is common in peripheral disorders. And the nystagmus in peripheral disorders intensifies when uh, the, the patient looks in the direction of the quick first, and this is called Alexander's Law. With central P lesions, there is a pure vertical or pure torsion on nystagmus. There's also a direction changing nystagmus. We're going to see that later. And if a nystagmus does not obey the Alexander's Law, that's also a feature of a central nystagmus. So here's an example of a direction changing nystagmus or gaze devote nystagmus. Um, uh, here uh, the patient is going to uh, look in each direction. So when looking to the left, here there is a left beating nystagmus. And as the patient go in the opposite direction, the nystagmus becomes right BB. So this is a feature of a central nystagmus and, you, you, and is hi highly suggestive of a central lesion rather than a peripheral lesion. Here's an example of a rebound nystagmus, which is a nystagmus that changes direction after holding the eccentric gaze position uh, for a few seconds. So here the patient is looking to the right and as the eyes go back to the center, the nystagmus becomes left beating. Whereas when the patient was looking to the right, it was right beating. So this is a rebound nystagmus. And again, another feature of um, a central vestibular dysfunction. Okay. Spontaneous uh, downbeat nystagmus independent of the gaze position is also a common sign of cerebellar dysfunction. So if you see that in a patient, it's highly suggestive of a central problem, usually from the flocculus or uh, parafloculus. So these regions of the cerebellum. How about the nystagmus in patients with BPPV? Uh, nystagmus is paroxysmal and in the posterior canal BPPV, which is the most common form of uh, BPPV is torsional upbeating towards the ground. And so if you ask the patient to lie down holding the phone in front of the eyes, then this is what you should see with the BPPV nystagmus involving the posterior canal. And this nystagmus is usually transient and goes away. So let's look at this case. So what, what does this patient have? A right posterior canal BPPV, left posterior canal BPPV, or right horizontal canal BPPV, or left horizontal canal BPPV. So there's a upbeating torsional nystagmus, and this is a Dix Hall Park. This is a nystagmus with the Dix Hall Park to the right side. Uh, so this is a, a typical uh, nystagmus that you would see with the right horizontal, sorry, with the right posterior canal BPPV. Uh, uh, Amir, you would tell him how the uh, nystagmus uh, upper pole beating towards the right tells, you know, because people get confused with clockwise and anti-clockwise. So. Yeah, I don't usually use those terms. I usually use the top pole of the eyes going to the right or to the left. And that's why I put those signs right and left. So in this case, the patient head went down and there's an upbeating torsional nystagmus with the fast phase of the nystagmus beating towards the right. So that's how you diagnose um, the direction or determine the direction of the nystagmus. Okay. The autolytic imbalance results in oculotute reaction, which consists of uh, torsional deviation of the eyes, uh, skew deviation, which is the vertical misalignment of the eyes, and the head tilt. Um, usually with uh, 
peripheral uh, lesions and with the lower brainstem lesions uh, with skew deviation, the lower eyes on the side of the lesion. And the, 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 both eyes uh, also uh, counter roll toward the side of the lesion. But this is not something that you can see during a virtual exam. So during the virtual exam, uh, perhaps one can look for the head tilt, which again, with the lower brainstem lesions or with the peripheral lesions going to be toward the side of the lesion or with the higher brainstem lesions going to be towards the opposite side of the lesion. Uh, something that you can try uh, to look for a skew uh, during your virtual exam would be the cover test and asking the patient to alternatively uh, cover their eyes. And this is what you see with skew deviation. Uh, the lower eye when uncovered goes up and the higher eye when uncovered goes down. Uh, so something to try to see uh, if the patient has a skew. Usually with the peripheral lesions, uh, the skew deviation if happens, uh, lasts shortly. So the chances that your patient has a central lesion with when you see skew deviation is higher. So let's see, if, if, if you see a patient with a head tilt like this, uh, uh, what would be, uh, uh, where would be the lesion? Is it a left labyrinthine, left pons region? Is it a, a lesion? Is it the right labyrinthine, right pons lesion? Is it the left pons or left uh, midbrain or right pons uh, or midbrain lesion? So um, this, uh, the only uh, uh, compatible uh, uh, option here that can uh, fit to the head, uh, head uh, tilt is the right labyrinthine or right pons uh, um, lesion. Amir, uh, yep. this question even I wouldn't be able to answer. So can you please explain this again? I'm always uh, confused about mm, the ocular tilt reaction. Um, yeah, so let's, let's go back again to, this is the key diagram to, uh, to help diagnose this. So with peripheral lesions and lower brainstem lesions, the lower eye is on the side of the lesion. The head tilt is towards the side of the lesion. The ocular counter roll is also towards the side of the lesion. So this means that both eyes will tort towards the side of the lesion. So for example, in this case, uh, when there is a lesion in the utricle or vestibular nucleus, uh, the head tilt, the lower eye, and ocular counter roll are towards the side of the lesion. Whereas when the pathways cross and get to the midbrain, uh, the higher part of the brain stem, the side switches. So that's why in this case, when, uh, when there is a head tilt to the right, this could be the right pontine and right, right midbrain lesion, or it could be a left um, uh, I'm sorry, this could be a right labyrinthine or right pontine lesion or could be a left midbrain lesion. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, you go by the which side is the eye lower and which side is the ear lower because it's the ear, the, her right ear is, sorry. Yeah. So right let's say. And the right so, eye lower. Yeah, so let's say if there is a right head tilt, Yes. and the right eye is lower. This could be either the right ear or right lower brainstem lesion or a left higher midbrain uh, lesion. Does that make sense? And yes. vice versa for the left side, yeah. So do you get the right ear going down, that is head tilted to the right, but yes. the right eye up? What was the last part of your question? Uh, so normally if the right eye uh, ear is now, if we go back to the image uh, of the lady. Oh, the lady, I'm sorry, okay. The next slide, yeah. So now we have our head tilted to the right. So the uh -huh. right uh, ear is down and yes. the right eye is also down. So right, the, so that's right. So, so that, that's why this could be a right labyrinthine or right pontine lesion or a left okay. midbrain lesion. Okay, yes. Okay. Right. Okay, so um, other uh, parts of the virtual exam uh, that can help uh, 
approach the patient include general appearance of the patient, usually the acutely vertiginous patient lie on one side with the affected ear uppermost. Um, this is uh, described by Fleur in 1970. Uh, we can ask the patient to stand uh, or watch their gait. Uh, one good way to study uh, the patient and look at the overall coordination of the patients to ask them to sit up or stand up from supine position without using their arm. This is good to look for, for example, hemiplegia, how well coordinated they are, and looking look also for ataxia. Can do enhanced maneuvers, including Romberg or tandem gait. A simple sensitive scale to assess for truncal ataxia is this scale developed by Carmona et al. Uh, the grade one is mild to moderate imbalance so with walking independently. The grade two would be severe imbalance with the standing, but uh, the patient cannot walk without support. And grade three is falling at upright posture. When, when somebody uh, scores at grade three, this is an alarming sign for a central lesion-like stroke. Okay, so let's combine the history and exam findings and get back again to our main differential diagnoses. Again, stroke, BPPV, vestibular neuritis, vestibular migraine, and many years. So what will be all of these findings combined for each of uh, these diagnoses? So in vestibular neuritis, the exam findings, as we discussed earlier, uh, mainly are spontaneous, sustained, mixed horizontal torsional nystagmus, which obeys Alexander law. Usually, it is not common to detect skew deviation in, in patients with vestibular neuritis, although there are cases that may present with that. Patients with a stroke, um, uh, they have bilateral direction changing gaze of oath nystagmus. They may have a nystagmus that obeys Alexander law. So if you see that kind of nystagmus, it does not rule out a stroke. Uh, they also can have downbeating nystagmus, skew deviation and head tilt uh, should also uh, suggest uh, uh, a central lesion such as a stroke in patients. Patients with vestibular uh, migraine usually have a normal exam, you, but sometimes patients may have a persistent position on nystagmus. For example, when they lie down, they may develop a nystagmus, but otherwise their exam should be normal. Patients with many years, they may also have a spontaneous nystagmus similar to vestibular neuritis. Um, uh, the nystagmus uh, may spontaneously change direction uh, depending on where they are during their attack. So it could be confusing in patients with many years. And in BPPV patients, um, uh, there's a typically a positional um, uh, nystagmus, which is paroxysmal. Usually the onset is after a latency and it is transient and it presents with a mixed vertical torsion of the, if it's the posterior canal or horizontal if it's a lateral canal BPPV. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize um, the important components of the history uh, are the quality of symptoms, uh, which uh, are vertigo, dizziness, and postural symptoms. When asking patients about vertigo, it's important to look for uh, features like uh, if they are internal or external. Uh, more importantly are timing and triggers, whether their symptoms uh, are, are presenting as a single episode or recurrent, uh, whether they're transient or persistent, whether they're brief or prolonged. And uh, when it comes to triggers, it's important to ask whether it's spontaneous or whether it is brought on by specific things like head motion, visual, sound, or positional induced symptoms. Other important factors to inquire about are age, vascular risk factors, other neurological symptoms, headache or neck pain, and hearing symptoms. And the main differential diagnosis when you talk with the DZ patients to consider include stroke, vestibular neuritis, vestibular migraine, many years, and BPPV. When it comes to the virtual exam, the helpful things that can help you narrow down a diagnosis is nystagmus in peripheral lesions, there's a mixed torsional nystagmus that follows the Alexander's law. 
the slow phases toward the side of the lesion with vestibular loss. In central uh, patient, in central lesions, the common pattern is pure vertical nystagmus. And in VPPV, there is a paroxysmal upbeating torsional nystagmus. Uh, ocular tilt reaction with head tilt, skew deviation, and ocular candle roll are the sign of vestibular imbalance that involves the autolith function. In peripheral and lower brainstem lesions, head tilt and lower eye are on the side of the lesion. So I think these are the important points to consider when you talk to a patient and try to virtually examine them. And hopefully that, that can help to narrow down the diagnosis. I'm going to stop here, sit here, and thank you again for giving me a chance to talk about this important topic. Thank you. Uh, I think this was a very nice talk and it's a uh, yeah, very common situation. In fact, just 20 minutes back, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, can you uh, uh, stop sharing? I'm going to stop, stop okay. sharing. I, I'm not able to share my screen, but I just got a call from my hospital and uh, there's this patient. I'll just try to read out the history of the patient. It's the same sort of problem. And uh, it's, I found, I mean, like a person who came with, uh, it's a past history of cardiac problem, 50 year old, suddenly now come with vertigo at 3 p.m. and is now better. Now, ideally, if I was there, I would have done a head impulse and immediately known whether there is a nystagmus or that. But getting the head impulse uh, test done by a houseman is sometimes not so good. I, I yes, can't... very challenging. <laughs> So uh, I, I am not able to get the head impulse test. Now, the second best thing I could do was ask, show me the patient's gait because that is something they cannot uh, make a mistake about. So they are showing me that the patient is able to walk normally, is able to stand without support and he has no nystagmus. So probably, probably I'm, I'm saying just now, just treat a stroke. The patient doesn't want to do a MRI just now. He's got a lot of anxiety. So we are treating as possible stroke, but since he's able to walk and stand, I think does the chance of a stroke go down? Well, well it's the, I think it's mostly the other way around. If somebody cannot stand or, yes. or walk, the chance of stroke is high, but yes. the other way around, it cannot yes. be this as a stroke. And walking. This yeah. patient is standing and walking without a problem. He felt dizzy in the afternoon came now to the hospital, got admitted. Now he's able to stand and walk. I'm treating as a possible TIA, but it can't be, uh, it's, it's less like, I mean, I'm, I wish I could go and do the head impulse just now. But I... How about the uh, eye movements? Were you able to get a, a recording of the eye to see if there's a nystagmus or not? No, there's not much. There's minimal nystagmus on looking to the right, minimal. Minimal, okay. Another patient two days back, I had similar, they called me that this patient has got uh, come again suddenly with vertigo. Um, this guy did have nystagmus beating to the right. His head impulse was done by my second year resident and it was a good head impulse. It was negative. Mm -hmm. um, now they already did an MRI, which was normal. So now we were left with the possibility a person has come with first time vertigo, MRI normal, nystagmus to the right and head impulse negative. So we have to think of stroke. Uh, what would you do in this case? And I will tell you what I did. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what I did was, I said, of course, you treat as stroke. The patient was young. So I said, no, I want to talk to the patient. So I did a Zoom call and I spoke to the patient and I asked him, how were you at night before this happened? So he said, I was fine. There was nothing at night. Um, I was, <laughs> he was like many of the people uh, just now, he was on the phone till 2.30 a.m. And he was doing something on the phone, uh, WhatsApp and uh, just browsing something on Facebook. And next day morning, he woke up and got there. Then I asked him the history. Do you have a history of migraine? He says, yes. And he was having a little heaviness in the head. Not much headache, but a little Bingo. <laughs> So this was migraine. But I said, till we do a scan after 72 hours, we treat you as stroke. We gave him double antiplatelet. I said, you wait in hospital for a day. At the end of 72 hours, we repeated a scan. It was normal and he was sent back saying that no longer will, are you allowed to use the mobile after 11 p.m. <laughs>
that that sounds like a good intervention <laughs> number of patients with migraine who mimic vestibular neuritis whose head impulse is negative but they are dangerous i mean you you can't be sure it is a, not a stroke yeah. what do you think yeah i think that's that, that that's a really reasonable approach uh, in, in these patients um, uh, it is um, really challenging uh, to examine the patient in the office with dizziness, let alone you want to do it remotely <laughs> um, uh, in our current situation. But uh, what I really find uh, reassuring is uh, getting a good quality um, uh, video recording of the eyes, either you know, uh, looking at it with the patient, getting the phone close to their eyes, or whether getting a good recording. Yes, the one you showed with lateral canal uh, horizontal nystagmus at home is excellent. So it's like now using yeah. video, EEG videos, home video for epilepsy diagnosis, uh, ruling out uh, non-epileptic attacks, and using the video for diagnosis of nystagmus. Yeah. Uh, Miriam Belgampola had done this study of using that portable uh, right. device at home. I tried to get the device for myself. Uh, this device is a small home uh, video in the stagmometry, which the patient, you give the patient and tell him the minute you get an attack, you wear this and show me what is the nystagmus. So, but most people will not have that. So at least you can do what uh, Amir has said, use a good uh, camera, uh, video, I mean, sorry, a mobile phone and record the nystagmus. Um, so uh, I had one more uh, anecdote. My brother is lives in China and um, about five years ago, one day at around 11 p.m. my time, he calls up and says, Sudhir, I'm getting vertigo. So he's about 50 years old. And uh, so I said, he's never had it in the past. So it was very difficult. I mean, I said, I don't know any neurotologist in China, in uh, Shanghai, so what to do? So initially I sort of panicked. Then I told him, okay, sit up, what is happening? So he sat up and he says, now it's not there. So at least we got it that it is a positional vertigo. Then I told him, you lie down on your right side. He said, oh, I'm getting vertigo again. So I said, okay, sit up again. Then it was not there. Then I told him now lie on your left and it was not there. So probably, probably I said, this is not a lateral canal BPPV. This is because that would happen on both sides, uh, symptoms. And probably this is a right posterior canal. So on the phone, I told him to do a home cement. And luckily it worked. So I told him, okay, sit up, turn your head to the left, fall on the right and throw yourself onto the left. And he did that and it went away. So sometimes you can do that. And... Right. Uh, Right. So I think, I, I think we have some questions here in the forum from the audience. Should we go over a couple of them? Uh, I think you can start taking them and I will answer you the, I mean, I'll ask, ask you the questions. So subjective versus objective vertigo. What's the basic difference in circuitry? Is there any difference? Well, I think vertigo by definition is subjective. <laughs> well, the objective vertigo will be perhaps the nystagmus seeing it in the patient's eyes. So um, uh, I think vertigo by definition is what the patients report. Uh, as I said, the important feature to ask about when you hear a patient report vertigo is first of all, what they mean. Is it a sense of spinning or, or is it just sense of a spatial disorientation and whether it is happening to themselves, meaning that it's the false perception of movement of themselves versus the movement of the environment. Yes. So does uh, whether you feel you are spinning or you feel the uh, environment is spinning, does that depend on the patient's personality, whether he's an introvert or extrovert or something like that? That's a good point. I think, it, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say that, um, what is actually happening in the brain, depending on whether they're saying the world is moving or whether they are moving. Yeah, sure. Because sometimes people report the fast phase of the nystagmus, if they, for example, have a nystagmus and vertigo related to that. Um, sometimes people uh, report the fast phase or sometimes report the slow phase. So it's really hard to, yes. to uh, rely on that. That's why it is important to focus on the timing and triggers. Like, for example, is it a single episode? Is it recurrent? How long you have it? Is it transient? Is it persistent? Is it intermittent? So these features are more important to rely on uh, when you ask about patient symptoms. 
Yes. Uh, somebody is asking, uh, saying, what does vertigo have anything to do with the rotatory movement of the Earth? Because we are on a moving cosmic object every minute, four degrees. So, yes. I, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question. <laughs> Not. We don't uh, make out that movement. Uh, otherwise, the whole world would be having vertigo all the time and it would be 24 hours. So vertigo has nothing to do with the rotatory movement. Well, I, mean, I can say our brain, we perceive gravity for sure. And it is a fundamental aspect of our function and spatial orientation. So, so yes, having uh, the wor earth gravity is an important feature to keep the world stable in front of our eyes at all times. But how directly it can contribute to vertigo, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. No, it won't. Okay, then Dr. Saurabh Jain, uh, he asks, how common is hearing loss in stroke? Well, when you hear a patient uh, report hearing loss, you should really worry about a stroke because uh, a peripheral loss of vestibular function uh, especially in vestibular neuritis, is not associated with hearing loss. So when very, you hear... Very, very important point, and I think you should uh, tell it again, because many people get relaxed when the person says, I've got tinnitus, I've got hearing yes. and vertigo. If it is chronic, recurrent, yes, you don't worry. But if it is an acute attack... Exactly. Exactly. And this, is, this uh, raises the suspicion for the ICOI stroke. So, which is a common presentation, hearing loss in so that if, uh, stroke. And repeat this, if somebody has tinnitus or hearing loss and within a few days or same time gets an attack of vertigo, be very worried. This could, this is not many years. This is not an ear problem. This is very likely a stroke. If you get only vertigo with no hearing loss or if you get only hearing loss with no vertigo, that is probably viral. But if you get a combination, you must worry. Yeah. Okay. Then somebody is asking, same thing, vestibular neuritis, do you have any chance of hearing loss if cochlear component is involved? None. So vestibular neuritis typically does not present with hearing loss. Okay. Then uh, if somebody comes with spontaneous intracranial hypotension and feels dizzy, how and where to doubt? So uh, dizziness in somebody with spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so orthostatic component would be an important feature of that. Uh, although I have seen few cases with intracranial hypotension that develop vestibular symptoms because of the compression of the eighth nerve. And so, so I would say main features that make you think about intracranial hypotension would be the headache and the orthostatic feature of the symptoms. Right. Somebody coming with only positional vertigo is unlikely to be uh, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. He would have more likely headache. Okay, then Dr. Neha is asking how to differentiate between cochlear and retrocochlear hearing loss clinically at the bedside. We have, of course, we see and other scores, but those are not bedside tests. Is there any bedside way of distinguishing? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if uh, there is a way. Do you know, Sudhir, of a way to... I don't know. Uh, overall, the amount of hearing loss, if a person seems to hear less, though he can make out a sound, if somebody can make out a tuning fork, but he can't hear what you are saying, it's likely to be retrocochlear. But, uh, I mean, because they cannot make out words and things like that, their deficit is more for that. But they may hear... Yeah. Then, you, then there might be a way to distinguish between high frequency and low frequency hearing loss at the bedside, but I'm not really sure you can really localize it to cochlear or retrocochlear at the bedside. So there is that uh, speech discrimination test. So maybe, I mean, I, this is, I'm just uh, uh, hypothesizing that if a person says he hears the tuning fork, the sound, not too bad, but when you speak to him, he can't hear the word, it might suggest more likely that the, it is central. It's a more inter, uh, sort of retrocochlear. Mm. I don't think there is any way. Okay, then same Dr. Neha asks, can how to distinguish between skew deviation and superior oblique palsy bedside? Oh, that, that, that's a good point. So uh, the skew deviation is a conjugate uh, the, uh, misalignment, meaning that you should see the torsional misalignment in both eyes. Whereas 
in superior oblique, there is only one eye uh, involved. Also, um, the direction of the torsional misalignment in the skew is different from what you see in the superior oblique palsy. I, I think I, I don't have the slide here, but uh, maybe I can share my screen for a second to show the difference if I open. But maybe you can go over another uh, slide when I, uh, another question while I'm putting up this slide. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, can you stop sharing? I'll let you know when you need to share. Uh, you want to? If you, uh, well, don't, don't share my screen yet. No, it's so not being not being okay. shared. You, okay. you can choose when you want to share. Okay, okay. so he's asking uh, if the, somebody, uh, if a person has only positional vertigo, what are the causes other than BPPV? Uh, well, as we said, sometimes people with migraine may, uh, may develop positional nystagmus, but uh, mainly a positional, transient positional vertigo is a feature of BPPV. Yes. So, uh, as you rightly said, positional vertigo is most of the time BPPV, but you can get it in some central causes. You can get it in migraine, the commonest. You can get it in posterior fossa tumors and sometimes Arnold Chiari malformation, etc. So, various posterior fossa lesions can cause, and there are ways you can't distinguish it from history. I don't think you can make out on the phone whether the person has uh, central positional or BPPV, but there are features, the nystagmus is different, it uh, remains for a longer time. So there are ways of distinguishing between central positional and uh, BPPV. Okay, you can share my screen now. Uh, uh, so yes. yes, I mean, uh, you will have uh, to share your screen. So oh, I'm sorry, yes, oh, sorry. I, I'm going to do that. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Are you seeing it? Yeah, uh, no, we, we see that you have started sharing, but okay, yes, now we are seeing. Okay, so this is how you can distinguish between skew deviation and, uh, oops, sorry, and superior oblique palsy. So as you can see, in skew deviation, both eyes are involved, whereas in superior oblique palsy, one eye is involved. In the skew deviation, the higher eye is intorted, whereas in the superior ob oblique palsy, the higher eye uh, is extorted. So you can either determine that by looking directly in the back of the eye and determine the direction of the door, uh, torsion by, by looking at the relative positioning of the fovea and the disc, or you can use the, use the red glass, double red glass examination to okay. determine that. Can you make out clinically on the fundus? I've never been able to do that. I mean, the only way uh, I could- it is, uh, With the fundus photo, yes, but not, not while you're directly looking. With the fundus photo, yes, you can do that. If you control for the positioning of the head, when you take the photo, yes, you can do that. But uh, yes, I agree that uh, when you're just directly looking at the patient's eye, it, it, must, it might be very challenging. Uh, uh, though, of course, I mean, but this, uh, but this red glass examination is very helpful. So, <clears throat> you ask the patient to. Uh, I hope everybody knows what the red glass is. So it's like a corrugated filter uh, that you can put in front of one eye, and in this case, you can put a red glass in front of one eye and a uh, white glass in front of a, another eye and shine the light into okay. patient's eyes. So this breaks the fusion. So one eye is going to see the red light long line, line and the other eye is going to see the white line. And then by asking the patient to report the positioning of the lines relative to each other, you can determine whether they are both tilted parallel or one is straight or one is tilted. So in superior oblique palsy, you see this case, whereas in the skew deviation, you see this case. Okay. So intorsion, just for the uh, one, intorsion means it is tilted towards the nose. Extorsion means it's tilted away from the nose. Correct. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, okay, then um, the next question. Uh, somebody wants to know 
What is the mechanism of Lermoyer's phenomenon? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. It is, it is a curious phenomenon that... Uh, I will uh, answer it later. Dr. Anirban Biswas is a leading neuroautologist. He is asking, how is agiotropic nystagmus generated in BPP? But uh, I don't know which BPPV he's talking about. Is it lateral? So, so, yeah, so it's a epigeotropic nystagmus is a feature of cupulolithiasis uh, of the horizontal canal BPPV. So when the stones are stuck to the cupula, not are in the canals, they call, cause apogeotropic nystagmus. But, but that's probably a whole um, talk of its own. Yeah. to show uh, how it's generated or how you can determine the side of the involvement. Okay, Dr. Ashish is asking, would you advise hyperventilation to assess the dizziness and nystagmus, especially during a video call consult? Yeah, if you can bring out, a if you want to bring out the dizziness, hyper bring out nystagmus or vestibular imbalance, it's a good way to uh, induce uh, nystagmus in patients that have a vestibular imbalance. Okay. So yes, you can do that. Okay. No. But 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 this is something that you can bring out in patients with chronic dizziness. Uh, yeah. If someone is presenting with acute dizziness, uh, you should look for spontaneous nystagmus rather than means to induce uh, the nystagmus. Yes. Similarly, in somebody with chronic nystagmus, you might do head shake and then see what is the effect. But that's not for an acute patient. Yeah. Okay, then Dr. Vinay Kumar Agarwal is asking, what percentage of vestibular migraine patients have headache infrequently? So, or no headache. So I think it's, he wants well, to know. That's part of the criteria. That's part of the criteria. So the migraine headache history is uh, an important uh, uh, criterion to make that diagnosis. So I would say all of them should have history of migraine or migraine features but they do not necessarily uh, need to have the headache during the disease. Yeah. So the problem is often uh, the headache happens at a different time or uh, as happens in older people, the headaches have stopped and now they come only with dizziness attacks. Uh, yeah. As you grow older, the headaches in migraine tend to get less. So you may have not have as much headache, you may get a past history. And another finding, I don't know, we find it in Indians. So somebody comes with vertigo, he has got vestibular migraine, is my diagnosis. And I ask him, do you have headache? And he says, no. Uh, do you have acidity? He says, yeah, I have acidity. I've been having it for years. And when you ask him, what is acidity? He says, no, I feel a little discomfort. And my head feels heavy and I vomit and I feel better. So they have <laughs> migraine, but they have been calling it acidity. So they somehow... The headache of migraine is not even called a headache. It's just called acidity and they take antacids for it. Right. So uh, when you have a person with vertigo uh, and you're suspecting possible migraine, ask for so-called acidity also and see whether it's only heartburn or it's also headache with the acidity. Um, Dr. Partha Sarthi asks, how sensitive is the brand of technique in sensitive? I don't know. He probably means... Uh, uh, effective is brand of in uh, exercises in clinical practice well, I, I, I think um... the question is how sensitive is brand of technique in clinical practice but obviously i think it's brand of is a therapy so it's he probably means how useful is it in clinical practice well it, it's a good uh, a maneuver to uh, use for treatment yes um Somebody else also asked internal versus internal what uh, external vertigo, but as you said, it doesn't matter. Then another person is asking cervical vertigo. How will you manage? Oh, yeah, yeah, the cervical vertigo. It's uh, it's a big controversy whether it even exists. Uh, but uh, I think um, if this uh, entity exists, the best therapy for it would be vestibular physical therapy or uh, activities that can help the brain uh, develop the skills needed to generate a better sense of spatial orientation, things like dancing or ping pong. Perhaps that is the best strategy that one can recommend to a patient that they believe have uh, cervical vertigo or dizziness. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, would you agree with me that most neuroautologists do not feel that there is any uh, that there is such an entity as cervical vertigo? You don't really get attacks of vertigo due to cervical spine. Mm -hmm. Most of the patients who will get vertigo are either BPPV, they move their neck and they have an X-ray cervical spine showing spondylosis, or sometimes migraine has neck pain and uh, vertigo. Right. Most so this is perhaps this is perhaps better to be called dizziness, you're right. So people with, uh, with this type of uh, problem don't report sense of spinning as you would expect or uh, motion as you would expect with vertigo. They will report, report mostly spatial disorientation. So uh, again, what my uh, Amir said just now, if somebody has attacks of vertigo, the room going round and round, it is very unlikely to be cervical spine, even if it is happening on moving the neck. But people with spondylosis or sudden neck uh, spasm may feel a little dizzy. They feel disoriented. They don't feel the room going round and round. So, right. uh, okay, so somebody is saying when the symptoms and signs do not fit into given categories, like so-called non-specific dizziness, how do you assess and manage? Especially in India, we get patients saying chakkar aata hai, means I'm feeling dizzy, I'm feeling dizzy, not fitting into any category. So I think you already told them how to use the timing and triggers, but still right, they... right. Yeah. So you, you, you will, you assume to motion or spatial orientation, and then you focus on timing and triggers. Like since when you've had it, is it days, minutes, hours, or is this the first time you've ever experienced this or you, you've had this before, or is it intermittent or persistent? Uh, and then you look at the triggers. How do, you, how do you get it? Does it depend on when you lie down or sit up? Is it when you look at your phone? Or is it sound induced, visual induced? So the, the, the list I went through can be very helpful. So timing, triggers. That's very important. Uh, often patients do not describe their symptoms properly. The other day I took a small talk on vertigo and I showed a patient who said, who had a CABG, and he said he gets headache on lying down and wherever his head touches, he gets headache. And because it was positional, I tested him and we put him on the right side. He said nothing. And we put him on the left and he says, yes, I'm getting headache. And it was headache. He was not describing vertigo and he got typical BPPV. So he had nystagmus and we repositioned him and his so-called headache went away. So patients can describe the symptoms as anything, uh, but you have to see what is bringing it on. So if it's positional and you see the nystagmus, whether he's calling it headache or dizziness, don't bother. It is BPPD. Okay. Then, uh, Dr. Tharak Memory is asking in the history to identify whether it's posterior canal or horizontal canal. If the patient says there's torsional oscillopsia, it may be posterior. And if he says horizontal os oscillopsia, it points, points to horizontal. I suppose you need a very intelligent patient, but- That's what? true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I would use what I used in my brother. Horizontal canal tends to be bilateral. So whether you lie on the right, you will get vertigo. You lie on the left, you get vertigo. That's and a good point. Yeah. Posterior canal often is unilateral. But I have seen posterior canal BPPV also get symptoms on the other side. So you cannot use it as a definite uh, history. Um, Okay, what about uh, drop attacks? Can you, Dr. Ashish ask, give an expert comment on drop attacks due to loss of vestibulospinal tone? You mean in patients with Meniere's disease? I suppose so. Right, so. Uh, we, when I was a houseman, my mm -hmm. teacher, Dr. Vadia, used to tell us that there is a classic syndrome of 50, 55 year old ladies who suddenly drop and uh, this so called idiopathic drop attacks. That has disappeared. There's no such thing. And we don't see such. What are these? What were these uh, patients? So what, what I hear from, pay, from patients is that they get a sudden feeling of tilt to the point that they cannot maintain their posture and balance anymore and they fall to the ground. So that's what they, they mean. In it. But usually that's in the context of having vertigo or not having vertigo. So, so if this is somebody who chronically has symptoms consistent with my, uh, with many years that would report something like that. But if otherwise somebody is just falling without any reason and you know it is not uh, PSP, you know, look for psychogenic. Okay. Uh, right. Again, 
in question i think we have to hammer it home can cervical spondylosis cause vertigo i think we have to say no 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 <laughs> nine times out of 10 uh can supine to sit help to distinguish skew from fourth sitting supine to yes um, there the, there are reports that uh, there is a change in skew deviation when you lie down compared to standing up but i personally haven't been able to entertain that in my patients but yes it is, has been uh, described okay uh, somebody is asking when there is no in the skew deviation not in fourth so skew changes supposedly from uh, sitting up to lying down but uh, fourth, fourth yeah even i have never really made out but uh, what i thought was most of the conditions where you have a fourth nerve palsy do not have other things you not have central uh, symptoms or a uh, uh, ataxia or anything so it's usually rare that i have to see is this skew or is this fourth nerve palsy if the person has vertigo and skew i know it is uh, and uh, ocular misalignment i know it is probably a skew and if he's got only fourth nerve palsy and the only symptom is diplopia it's unlikely to be skew right so one would uh, but but patients with severe skew do report diplopia Yes, no, but the diplopia would not be the only symptom. In a fourth nerve palsy, probably the only symptom will be diplopia. They will probably right. not complain of uh, dizziness and vertigo and thing. Okay, then somebody uh, is asking when there is no asymmetry in both vestibular apparatus, what are the symptoms and signs? Possibly, I think he means bilateral. Okay. Okay. Well, well, this means that perhaps if some assuming that person is telling you that they're dizzy. Uh, then you would de you'll be dealing with somebody like vestibular migraine patient. So they don't have necessarily imbalance in their vestibular ocular function, but perceptually they're dizzy. Um, so again, the symptoms are perceptual rather than vestibular ocular. Um, and the other features can really help you uh, uh, diagnose those patients, like history of migraine or you know aura or other features of vestibular migraine. What about bilateral vestibulopathy? So, so patient, yeah, but again, that, that would not be somebody that call you acutely to tell you that they're dizzy. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the main feature would be oscillopsia in those patients, and that's an oscillopsia that is motion-induced, not a spontaneous oscillopsia. Acute, dizzy, and bilateral thing would, would be somebody who's receiving gentamicin or something like that, so be careful there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Somebody is asking, how frequently do you see apogeotropic variety of posterior canal BPPV? So uh, this is Dr. It's Mangit. Not, yeah, so it, I would say, I would say um, the geotropic uh, perhaps is more common because the chances of the uh, autoconia getting stuck on the cupola is less than just floating in the fluid of the canal. Yes, so uh, in my uh, experience, it's about 5 to 10% of the BPPV that I see uh, are uh, apogeotropic. Sometimes when I see a patient with posterior canal BPPV and I'm treating it, when the particles are partly gone on the uh, partly repositioned, you may get temporarily uh, apogeotropic type of uh, BPP. Then... Uh, Dr. Sripad Rao is asking, can you comment on phobic postural vertigo? I think uh, now it, the terminology has changed and maybe you could just tell them about triple PD. Yeah, so, um, uh, so the, the, this type of uh, uh, dizziness would be uh, in line with vestibular migraine. So it's a perceptual dysfunction. So you would expect a normal examination uh, and it's less episodic. So it's more like a persistent daily fluctuating problem rather than episodic uh, presentation like you see in vestibular migraine. And uh, doctor, I mean, there is something called uh, PPPD, perceptual persistent postural dizziness, and there are lots of articles on it. And it can sometimes be something like a common final pathway. Somebody has migraine, somebody has BPPV, somebody has vestibular neuritis, and then develops this super added uh, thing later on. Uh, what? Yeah, uh, it's, it's persistent postural perceptual dizziness. That's where the 3P is coming from. Okay. Somebody is asking sudden onset first episode of vertigo. What is the use of MRI? 
Well, um, you try to narrow down your diagnosis first and see if you're dealing with the stroke patient. Uh, and if you have a high suspicion for a stroke, then you can ask for MRI because the eye movement examination uh, is actually more helpful to rule out a stroke than getting the MRI. Like for example, if your patient has a nystagmus with the features of a central dysfunction, as I described, or, where the, or when there is a skew deviation, uh, or where when there is a, a positive, negative head impulse, assuming that you can actually examine the patient, then, uh, then these are really highly sensitive and reasonably specific to tell you whether you're dealing, dealing with a stroke patient or not. Yes. So uh, I'll just rephrase it. So if you have a patient like this with first time vertigo, you must do what the Dr. Amir described. That is the HINTS protocol. You do the head impulse. The head impulse should be positive. Uh, if the head impulse is negative or if the nystagmus is changing direction or if you have skew, any of these, you must think of a stroke then whether your MRI is normal or abnormal, you should think of stroke. So that if you use the hints, that is almost 100% sensitive, while MRI is only 88%. So you, in 10 or 12% of patients, you will miss a stroke if you go only by MRI or even MRI angio. And even a 3T MRI is not better than the clinical examination, which you can do in five minutes. So there's no substitute for the clinical examination. Uh, Somebody is asking, Dr. Rahil Ansari asks, can we get positive head impulse tests in BPPV? Assuming the, there, you have so many stones in, the, in one canal that is causing a canal jam, yes. But no, it's not a common finding. Uh, sometimes I've seen that in a person with uh, vestibular neuritis affecting a division, only the superior division and the inferior division is spared. So the posterior canal is spared and then patient can get BPPV afterwards. So they may have some signs of uh, a partial head impulse and also the posterior canal is spared. So they may get, there's a name for it. I forget the name of that syndrome. So uh, it's posterior canal BPPV occurring in somebody who had uh, vestibular neuritis earlier. Uh -huh. The posterior. I, I forget the name. There is a particular. Okay, then in somebody is asking in Parkinson disease also there is vertigo. What is the likely mechanism? Is it just orthostatic hypotension or something else? Well, um, typically patients with Parkinson's disease do not present with vertigo. There could be a spatial disorientation, dizziness, uh, and postural abnormalities in uh, patients with. Uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, that could be related to the sensory dysfunction associated with Parkinson's disease, or could be related to um, postural problem. There's this term uh, and diagnosis uh, that you can see in patients with Parkinson's disease called PISA syndrome which is like patients that are yeah, tilted in one direction that, 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 that is believed to be a combination of both perceptual and postural dysfunction in these patients. Yes. So one of the features of Parkinson's is imbalance and postural uh, instability. And the patient does not say I'm feeling imbalance. He calls that also dizziness. He may call it vertigo also. People use the word very non-specifically. But of course, uh, there are studies which suggest that maybe patients with Parkinson's have a higher incidence of BPPD. So when a person with Parkinson's says I'm dizzy, even though I know probably it is due to the Parkinson's, I still do a Dix Hulpike and make sure it's not BPPV. So it's worth okay. doing. That's anyway. a good point. Yeah. Um, temporal neocortical seizure, how to rule out? How often do you see seizure presenting as uh, vertigo? Only in textbooks I've seen it so far. <laughs> one, one then I have... Uh, with the history, I've never seen in an attack. It's an elderly person with attacks of non-positional vertigo lasting for a few minutes. And rarely I like to do that, but I started him on an anti-convulsant and they stopped. Then to be sure, I stopped it and the attacks recurred again and then we restarted it. So I don't know. I mean, I'm never sure. Okay, somebody is asking, 40-year-old female with no comorbidities, with acute vertigo, severe disabling symptoms, difficulty in walking, she suspected CVA, but MRI, MR angio, MRV normal. She has a right sensory neural hearing loss and vertigo improved with beta histine, which vertigo doesn't improve with beta histine. 
ataxia still persists is it still a cva and when you say attack still persists are we talking about days or hours ataxia the ataxia persists oh the ataxia persists well yeah i think i, I would highly suspect a stroke in this case it's still so uh, and the, the second one on my list would be many years disease if um, if the patient fits the uh, description right so if the person has an mri mri angio etc normal on day 1 does not mean you have got away and it's not a stroke sometimes yeah. the a stroke may be seen only after 72 hours so don't get uh, or it could be missed or the cuts are not you know at the right level to capture the stroke yes okay then dr chandrashekar asks what is the role of head impulse test in bilateral vestibulopathy that's uh, not today's uh, talk but of course um, head impulse test is important dr abhinay hucche asks the supine roll test is positive on both sides which side is the culprit again you can't answer on the phone but uh, <laughs> natural canal there are rules but so 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 maybe we can say this is either a bilateral posterior canal bppb or unilateral horizontal canal bppb yes and dr abhinay there are rules for trying to find out which ear is affected in lateral canal bppb depending on whether it is apogeotropic lateral canal or geotropic and that those can't be found out on the phone so uh, so here maybe maybe you have to arrange a bppb talk we'll have one we will have like you, you you have many questions about bppb yes. here <laughs> uh this thing about subjective uh, i was once on a i was going on a cruise and uh, i was on the way to italy going near um, uh, matera so our cruise was going to land near matera and on the earlier night you know it was a cruise and i had a little drink too many and i when i went to lie down i felt the room going spinning round and round so i thought possibly it is a seasick or maybe i had an extra drink but then when i checked i was turning in bed and everything was going round so i felt when i'm lying down i felt it was going the other way so i said oh god i'm getting apogeotropic bppv this is going to be difficult but you know i messaged dr asprella who stays in uh, matera right. he's expert in lateral canal so i told him i am getting this uh, lateral canal bppv and coming tomorrow if it's not gone you you will have it. but the thing is i took a video of myself and what i felt was apogeotropic actually on the video it was geotropic so subjectively what you feel is different so whether you feel the slow phase or you feel the fast phase i don't know like you you said uh, earlier that whether it is slow phase or fast phase you cannot say so i think best is to have a recording of your uh, of the eye movements and luckily before i reached matera it had got i did a gufoni on myself and it went away so okay then uh, somebody is asking last i think a few one or two uh, questions does vestibular neuritis make the patients prone for bppv correct so it's common to see bppv a few weeks after a bout of vestibular neuritis yes dr santosh i think i'll take the last question if somebody has episodes of many hours of vertigo oscillopsia with gaze evoked downbeat nystagmus can that present in vestibular migraine if the mri brain is normal recurrent attacks of uh, vertigo downbeat nystagmus uh, well, but, but the, 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 and this is a spot this is a spot if this is a spontaneous nystagmus spontaneous. i would not uh, i would not uh, put vestibular migraine on top of my differentials unless i rule out everything else i would suspect something more like in line with episodic ataxia yes he's written rather 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 than a vestibular migraine Okay, Amir. Thank you for the excellent talk. This was. Oh, thank you for having me, sir. That was very useful. And uh, if I, I'm sure, if this was normal time, people would have been outside enjoying themselves on a Friday night rather than listening to this talk. <laughs> uh, but if it was a Friday night, I mean, if it was normal time, you would also not have agreed to give us a talk <laughs> like that. Would have you would have been busy. So thank you again for giving us the time. It's been a Anytime. pleasure. Anytime. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Good night, everyone.